say we begin? So this is the mammalogy course. We are going to be talking about mammals and what makes them mammals, and then a little bit about uh, the different classes of mammals. Um, we're not going to go deep into it because that would be an entire semester worth of, of information there. Um, so I'm just going to give you as much as I think is relevant in Montana. Um, and then we're going to go around and look at our pelts and our skulls and do some match and just see what we come up with. So, what is a mammal? Up here, what do you think a mammal, how many mammals do you see up here? Four, let's see. One, two, three. Good job. So, we have the bat, which is a mammal. We have a blue whale, we have a dolphin, and a kangaroo. All of those are mammals. Sometimes I do have to clarify that birds are not mammals. Uh, fish are not mammals. Frogs are not mammals. Nothing else up there. <laughs> so what do you guys think of when you think of mammals? Are there like some characteristics that you learned from like maybe in school or just, you know, that you've heard kind of characterize a mammal? Live birth. Live birth. So that's a great one. Anything else? Breathe the air. Good one. Yeah, so they can regulate their temperatures. So sometimes you'll hear they're warm-blooded. Um, anything else? Yes, mammary glands. Perfect. And what's an, one other? There is one that I'm thinking of that's pretty obvious when, it, when you look at something. Fur. Awesome. So. Excellent question. They do. They have hair. So um, we'll discuss it in just one slide, but all mammals at one time in their lifespan have hair. They also have mammary glands, which is why they're called mammary, because they're mammals. And then they're endothermic, so what we conventionally think of as warm-blooded. So let's begin with hair. So at least some hair at some point in their lifetime um, will be found on a mammal. So when we have like blue whales and dolphins, um, usually we see that in the very early stages of their life. Um, dolphins are born with mustaches, basically, uh, just a little bit of fur on top of their lip. And then blue whales actually have hair in uh, the fetal development. So they don't have them uh, as adults, neither dolphins nor blue whales do, but they have that at some point in their lifespan, which is, means that we can still say all mammals have hair or fur. Um, you will find as, as you get into science, um, there's a lot of debate about what characterizes a group. Um, and as soon as you get into generalities, like saying all mammals have hair, there's always somebody who will be like, well, what about this? And it'll be a valid, it'll be valid. It'll be like, yeah, well, blue whales don't have fur right now. Um, but they do at one point. <laughs> so we have some notable types of hair. Um, we have guard hairs, which are going to be protective hairs that are kind of overlay fur. Um, you can see this um, maybe even on some of the pelts that you have at your table. There might be some guard hairs. Um, whenever I think about guard hairs, I think about porcupines. Um, they have some very unique guard hairs, which have been you know, solidified into shafts. Um, that are pokey. That's their big defense mechanism. Um, that's still a type of guard hair. Uh, then we have the underfur, which is made of wool, which we define wool as something that continuously grows, versus fur, which is relatively short and has a finite growth. Um, and then it could also be veli, which is the down or fuzz um, it's usually found on newborns, infants, um, sometimes field, fetal development, um, but it's that really soft, uh, very downy type of fur. Um, and then we have, I really hope I say this correctly, vibrissae. We're going to pretend that that's correct, <laughs> um, which are whiskers. So we have those long, stiff hairs um, that are surrounded at their base by a lot of sensory nerves. Um, and a lot of animals rely on, on whiskers for um, catching prey, detecting predators, um, kind of making sense of what the world around them when they don't have 
excellent um, eyesight or excellent hearing. Um, it's especially helpful uh, for navigating at night, so nocturnal animals you'll often see have really pronounced uh, whiskers. And whiskers also don't have to be limited to the face like we traditionally think of them, like, you know, cat whiskers. Um, these are an example of bat whiskers. Um, these are whiskers along the toes, um, which is really helpful when you're a crevice roosting bat because you are hanging on to stuff with your toes. Um, and you want to make sure that you have a good grip, that you can sense what's going around, going on where you have that roost. Um, and then they also do have whiskers on their face. Um, so they have a lot of sensory or, or sensory use for those whiskers going on. And then we have a horse, lots of whiskers that goes all around the, the face, um, not just, you know, again, when we traditionally think cat whiskers from that, you know, kind of upper part of the chin or the cheeks. Um, some animals have it all around the face. Um, squirrels have them near their ankles. Um, you'll kind of see, uh, when you start to see whiskers in different places, you can start to consider why it's helpful um, and why that's an ad adaptation that the animal has put energy towards. Um, hair can also be used for um, insulation. Um, so that's actually a really critical part of what fur does for mammals. Um, otter fur is going to be about a thousand times more dense than our hair. Um, and that's because they are going to be in an aquatic environment most of the time. Um, and usually a cold aquatic environment. Um, and their fur, as you can see, is, it's not nice and, and perfect and flat. Um, and that's actually by design. Um, the more tangles that they have in their fur, the more air pockets they can create within that fur. Um, and that keeps them even more insulated. Um, we have signaling as a purpose. So a lion's mane, for example, those are guard hairs that have been elongated. Um, and for a lion, um, what, is a, what is a mane usually signal in a lion? Male, yeah. So it's sexually dimorphic, right? So sexual dimorphism is when one species uh, has different appearance between the male and female. Um, so for males, the lion's mane um, not only demonstrates that they're male, but can also demonstrate um, age or dominance. Um, so the darker the male, the um, more dominant or the older, um, which is one of the things that scientists like to point out about the movie Lion King. Um, Scar has the darker mane, so theoretically he would be the more dominant lion. So, Disney got it wrong again. <laughs> um, it can also be protection, right? So we have the hairs for porcupines that have been solidified into their spines. Um, and if you've ever seen a porcupine in real life or a video of them um, using those spines, you can see that it is part of them. Um, it does have that uh, follicle root, and they can make the spines stand up as they go or lay down. Um, so a defensive porcupine is going to have those spines up and ready to defend themselves no matter what, air, um, what direction the predator approaches them from. Um, so that's another great adaptation. And then for a skunk, right, we have um, pretty, pretty trademarks uh, Appearance, right? Nobody really mistakes a skunk for anything else with that black and white patterning. Um, that's the same for predators as well. Predators understand what a skunk looks like, um, and those are warning colors to a predator who might mistake it for something else. Um, that nope, this is a skunk, and messing with them is going to be very unpleasant. It can also be great camouflage. So these are uh, proboscis bats. Can you see all of them? So this is one. All of them are in a line there. And they're perfectly adapted to be you know, fitting in with their um, environment. So they just roost on tree limbs because their camouflage is so good that they don't really need to hide in crevices or anything like that to you know, get away from predators. Um, so it's pretty amazing to see them. Um, if you get a chance to watch a video, I highly recommend it. Um, because they're camouflage, you can be looking right at them, as you guys just saw, and not see them. A uh, proboscis bat. They're even cuter up close. They have really um, quite prominent noses. <laughs> okay, so mammary glands. Um, 
These are also uniquely mammalian. Um, some other animals can produce milk-like substances, like pigeons um, have crop milk, um, but it's not true milk like we consider with mammals. Um, both males and females will have mammary glands. Um, whether or not a mammal will have a nipple depends on what uh, type of mammal it is. So monotremes uh, do not have nipples. They lactate through their skin, and their young lap it up from their skin. Um, and we'll talk about monotremes in a second. But these are, are animals like the echidna and the uh, platypus. Um, marsupials have nipples within their pouches on their lower abdomen. Um, and marsupials are fascinating, and we're going to talk about them too. But um, yeah, it, the, their lactation is just wild. Um, <laughs> and then so yeah, males and females both possess those mammary glands. Um, but male lactation is comparatively rare in species. Um, we have the Dyak fruit bat, the lesser short-nosed fruit bat, and then the Mismark masked flying foxes. Um, so the Mismark, uh, <laughs> sorry, Mismark masked flying fox, a lot of repetition there, um, and then the Dyak fruit bat. Um, those are both uh, species that have regular male lactation documented. Um, one thing that has been suggested as far as uh, use for this or a reason that they lactate is to kind of offset some of the pressure that is on the female during lactation. Um, it seems like male lactation is a pretty adaptive trait, and I assume anybody who has lactated and had to feed a baby would speak to that. <laughs> seems like a very helpful trait for male humans to have more of. And then we have endothermy. And so this is going to be the most complicated part of this lecture. Once we get through it, it'll be, we'll have survived. Um, but we'll make it as, as simple as possible. <laughs> so ectothermic is what we traditionally think of as cold-blooded animals. Um, and these are going to be snakes, lizards, turtles. Um, this involves the migrating from microclimate to microclimate to maintain their internal body temperature. Um, so when a turtle goes out and basks in the sun, it's doing that to warm up its internal temperature. Um, when it gets hot enough, in, you know, in, in the morning it goes out and basks in the sun, and then once it gets to high noon when the sun is too hot, it goes and it either goes underwater or it finds a nice shaded area. Um, and that just helps regulate its internal temperature by behavioral means rather than metabolic means. Um, endothermic, on the other hand, is maintaining that body temperature meta uh, metabolically. So our metabolic processes give off heat um, just as a you know, function of um, uh, metabolism. So when that heat is uh, created, we use it to generate our own internal body heat rather than having to rely on microclimates and our behavior to have that body heat. Um, we call this the thermal neutral zone, which is the range of environmental temperatures in which our metabolism uh, doesn't have to work harder to uh, keep our internal body temperature optimal, if that makes sense. Um, so basically, it's the temperature range that we can exist in without having our metabolism um, having to make us shiver or having to make us sweat. Um, because both of those things are energetically costly. It's making our body work harder to keep us within a good range. Um, this is, as, as I just indicated, um, endothermy is energetically costly um, versus ectothermy, uh, cold-blooded animals. They are able to survive um, in resource-scarce conditions much better than we are. So um, we have to keep uh, eating and drinking and making sure that our metabolism is fueled enough for us to maintain that uh, TNZ zone or TN, TN zone. It's not the TNZ zone. I'm so sorry. <laughs> to maintain that thermal neutral zone, um, we have to make sure that our metabolism has enough fuel to work, right? Um, and then when we have these ectotherms, they're able to just survive based on what they have already gotten. Um, oh, sorry, I am going to redo my brain one second. OK, so for example, we have alligators and crocodiles. They'll kind of go into a torpor whenever um, 
whenever temperatures go too low. And they can do that pretty easily because they don't have that metabolism that we do. Um, so when we have a metabolism that is working like we have to maintain that internal body temperature, um, we can't go for those long periods without food and water. So there's a give and take, right? So we don't depend on the migration of, to microclimate to microclimate to maintain our internal body temperature. But we do have to exert a lot more energy into keeping ourselves independent of those microclimates. So this is an example just visually. So um, animals that are ectothermic are going to be have way more of a um, body temperature range based on the environmental temperature. So if an animal can't find uh, the shade or the sun that it needs and it's ectothermic, it's going to have a very wide range of body temperature. That could be harmful to it depending on what range it gets to. Um, ectotherms tend to be adapted to be uh, to put up with a wide range of internal body temperatures just by nature of, of what they are. Um, we, on the other hand, meaning endotherms, have a much more limited uh, range of body temperatures that we can tolerate. Um, so we also have, <laughs> as you can see, much less variation. Um, and that's thanks to our metabolism. Um, but our, metas our metabolism puts out a lot more energy. Um, and that's what that second uh, picture is showing you. So whereas the endotherm or the ectotherm doesn't really take a lot of energy to maintain its body temperature, um, we, we need a lot more. So within endotherms and ectotherms, there's also homeotherms and poikilotherms. Let's say I said that right too. It's also called, called heterotherms. I don't know, my, my professor taught me with poikilotherms and I think partly it was just to see who could pronounce it and who couldn't. Um, and I was in the, the who couldn't group. Um, so homeotherms are animals that are able to maintain a stable internal temperature independent on, of the environment. And that sounds a lot like endotherms, right? But the trick is you can be endothermic and a homeotherm or you can be endothermic and a poikilotherm. We'll go over that in just a second. <laughs> so po poikilotherms are animals that alternate between ectothermy and endothermy through behavioral adaptations. Um, and this goes into torpor and hibernation. So when we have torpor, we are dropping our body temperature to the external temperatures um, for part of the day. So hummingbirds will do this, and camels will also do this. Um, so camels can switch between ectothermy and endothermy within the same day, depending on their levels of hydration and the external temperatures. So if they're getting too hot, if they're dehydrated, they'll switch over to ectothermy. Um, and that reduces the metabolic rate that they need to sustain them, themselves and to protect their, their brain temperature, which is really what they're trying to preserve because the first thing to go when we have a fever, right, when our, when our temperature goes over 104 degrees or something, um, they start to worry about whether or not our brain is healthy um, because our brain is very sensitive to temperature. Um, and so torpor is that shorter point. Um, hibernation, on the other hand, is going to be a long form of winter torpor. Um, this is used to survive freezes and to compensate for when resources are scarce during the, the, during the winter. Um, animals can and do wake out of hibernation due to disturbance or due to good weather. So um, during periods of good weather, especially during spring, um, you can kind of see sometimes bats will come out of hibernation a bit early. Um, and you'll see them for a few days, and then once the weather goes back to normal, which is usually rainy and not a lot of insects, they'll disappear again. And basically, they're going back into torpor. Um, when it comes to bats, this is also not a great thing because uh, white nose syndrome. Have any of you heard of white nose syndrome? A couple of you. Does anybody know what it does? Exactly. It wakes them up. So it's a fungus. Um, and I always thought that it was the fungus itself that killed bats, but it's actually the fungus 
um, gets onto their face and wakes them up out of hibernation early. And so they're woken up, and they're, it's still middle of the winter. There's still no resources for them. The insects are not there. There's not enough uh, water for them. And they starve or dehydrate to death. Um, so that's why that's a problem. Um, they really depend on having that really low heart rate, that low breathing rate, that low metabolism that can be created through um, being an endotherm that is poikilotherm as well. Um, that means that they can just survive on their winter stores, um, just like bears do when they get fattened up in the fall. And then throughout the winter, they are able to not have to keep going out and getting resources. Um, so yeah, when white nose syndrome wakes them up, they're not able to get any new resources and their metabolism is just burning through what winter stores they have. And then we have estivation, which is a long summer torpor which is used by a lot by desert species um, to survive really long, hot, dry stretches. Um, and that, just like, I mean, again, just like we have uh, species in temperate areas that use hibernation as a way to survive resource scarce uh, seasons, um, desert animals will use the same adaptation just in the summer. So. This is a nice little diagram. So this is the most helpful thing I got out of my uh, mammalogy course, um, which was just to see where those overlap. So an endothermic, homeothermic animal is going to be most birds and mammals. Um, tuna is another large fish slip in there, but that's not what we're talking about because we don't have tunas in Montana. Um, so basically, this would be what? Any normal animal that doesn't go into hibernation, doesn't rely on torpor, um, it's like us, right? We're just operating as we do throughout the seasons. Um, maybe we do eat a little more in winter, but it's not a survival tactic. It's just, it's, you know, the season to eat more. Um, endothermic and poikilothermic are going to be what, like, what examples did I just give? So animals that rely on hibernation. But bears, perfect, bears and bats, yeah. And then ectothermic and homeothermic will be some tropical reptiles and possibly dinosaurs. And then we also have deep sea animals. So these are animals that are um, cold-blooded, so they rely on external uh, conditions and their behavior with those conditions to maintain their internal body temperatures, but they don't have that, that wide variety of internal temperatures. Um, and as such, they don't have to rely on torpor or hibernation or any of the other um, behavioral adaptations. And then ectothermic and poikilothermic are going to be most fish, amphibians, and reptiles, and most invertebrates. So by and large, there's the two biggest groups are going to be ectothermic and poikilothermic, and then endothermic and homeothermic. And then there's just the outliers in that other diagonal. There's also some of the eight main mammal characteristics um, that I didn't mention. We have the four-chambered heart, mammary glands, which we talked about, hair and fur, which we talked about, warm-blooded metabolisms. Um, there's also three bones in the middle ear that we consider pretty characteristic of mammals, um, which is nice because the unfortunate thing about mammary glands, hair, and um, warm-blooded metabolisms is they're not great for finding in the fossil record, right? That doesn't really get maintained. Um, but what does get maintained are the three bones in the middle ear, um, which are the, uh, they're called ossicles, and they're the malle malleus, incus, and stapes. Um, and then also the fact that we have one jawbone, so many an other animals have either two jawbones that make up their lower jaw, um, or you know some some number of, of bones, um, and this actually creates kind of a weakness in their jaw. So when you think about you know if we have a jaw, where is my jaw? So if we have a jaw like this, this is going to be stronger than if this was in two parts, um, just by nature of structural integrity, right? Um, and so mammals tend to have a stronger bite force. Um, when it comes to having, you know, that one 
one piece for their jaw. Um, their ear bones are also really good for acute hearing. So there's some uh, a train of thought that these two things, the three inner ear bones and then the uh, single lower jaw piece, um, are kind of adaptive towards uh, a metabolism that requires more energy intake, right? So if we can hear our prey better, we can get more of it. If we can, you know, if we have more powerful jaws, we can eat, you know, either higher value prey or more prey. Um, and so that maintains a metabolism that is energetically costly, like it is to be warm-blooded. Okay, R selection and K selection. So our selection is going to be, we've, we've kind of talked about this in the past without having put a label on it. So um, when we talk about like the zebra mussels, um, we have an unstable environment that is density dependent and small organisms that make a lot of babies at one time. Versus K selection, which is gonna be a stable environment, dense, density, or I'm sorry, density dependent, R is density independent. Um, and so with K, there tend to be larger organisms that produce fewer offspring at once and invest a lot more energy into those offspring. So it kind of come down, comes down to these two different lifestyles where you know, the, the mussels produce a bunch of uh, eggs at once and send them out into the water and hope that as many as they can will survive to adulthood. Um, versus us, for example, we don't do that. We have like one or two or three babies at once, um, and we invest a lot of time and care into making sure that they make it to adulthood. Um, and so we would be K-selected versus muscles, which would be R-selected. R-selection usually has a pretty short life expectancy and a uh, early rate of sexual maturation. Um, which we talked about before when we were comparing the zebra mussels to the other, our native mussels. Anybody remember what those are called? Western pearl shell. <laughs> <laughs> so to give more of a visual, um, we have this, you know, oysters, which produce 500 million eggs a year, versus chimpanzees, who produce one every five years. Um, so that's the two extremes, and then somewhere in the middle we have frogs and hares. Um, and then we also have where this intersects with survivorship. So um, we have a K selection, we have a constant mortality, and then we have an R selection. So when we have R selection, we imply that there's a lot of mortality early on in the life. Um, so because they produce so many eggs, right? that implies that something's out there eating them when they're young. Um, so they need to make a lot of eggs to ensure that something survives. Um, and so we see the highest rate of mortalities either as you know, eggs or as adolescents um, versus case selection, which implies that there's probably not a lot of early um, mortality happening. Um, if it was, you know, having one baby every five years like the chimpanzees do, that would be problematic, right? Because if you know, we had a 90% rate of um, adolescence uh, mortality, that wouldn't really be sustainable versus it's fully sustainable in an oyster. Um, and then we have somewhere in the middle, so like squirrels, where survivorship is kind of random. Um, a adult squirrel is just as likely to be picked off by an owl, you know, on its nightly jaunt around for, you know, garbage that you've left out on the porch. Um, as a baby is to be, you know, found by a fox that's, you know, rummaging around in the burrow. So those are the three types of survivorship curves as well as R and K selection. Okay, now we're through to the animals. <laughs> so monotremes are going to be platypi platypus and echidnas. Um, we have five extant species, and extant meaning that are still living. It's the opposite of extinct. Um, so the differences with monotremes is that they lay eggs instead of bearing live young. Um, so this kind of is like, we usually hear in school, like they, mammals give birth to live young. Not all of them. There's two groups that do not. Um, 
platypus and echidna will lay eggs. Um, they will then incubate their eggs just like any like a bird or a reptile would do. Um, and then those eggs will hatch and they will nurse those young with milk produced from their mammary glands that they secrete down onto their body and the young can then suck up through their fur. Um, they have limbs that are oriented with the humerus and femur held lateral to the body. So if you've ever seen a platypus swim, they kind of go like this instead of like this, where we usually see with mammal locomotion. And so that's because of how their body is oriented. And if you see them walk on land, it'll be very similar. They, they are kind of splayed out. Um, and it's the same thing with echidnas, although to a slightly lesser degree. Um, they lack teeth in as, as adults, but they do have that characteristic bill or beak. And then they have low met metabolic rates. Um, so they have a lower uh, body temperature than most other mammals do, and that requires less metabolism and less energy to keep going. So they are similar in the fact that they have fur, four-chambered heart, a single jawbone, those three middle ear bones, and then mammary glands with lactation. Marsupials. How many marsupials do you think we have in North America? We do have one, which is the Virginia opossum. <laughs> one of my favorite species. Um, so yeah, out of the 272 species currently you know, living worldwide, we have only one single marsupial. Um, and that's kind of due to the abundance, we think, of the placental mammals that have kind of displaced uh, mar marsupial mammals, um, whether it's a competitive edge or whether, you know, just kind of human, um, uh, our own human habitation where we tend to bring along the placental mammals like cats and dogs rather than marsupials. Um, that could also uh, be attributed to, you know, the decreased number of, of marsupials in North America and many other countries. Um, but that's a problem for evolutionary people to figure out. Um, so placental mammals usually have a number or have an even number of incisors uh, with a maximum, a maximum of three on each upper. We have four, um, whereas marsupials will have an odd. So it'll be five and four, um, or they'll have three and two, or I don't know if any of two or one, but let's say just for example, that is true. <laughs> uh, the females also have doubled reproductive tracts. Um, our reproductive tracts in placental mammals have fused together. Um, in marsupials, they have not. So there are genuinely two different reproductive tracts going on. Um, and because of that, males have bifid penises to reach both of those tracts at once. And then the young are gonna be born very early in development. Um, it's a very short gestation. And the, when the young are born, I mean, they look like embryos. They're extremely underdeveloped. Um, their organs have just become capable of functioning outside of their mother's like internal system. Um, but they do have very developed forearms because they will use those forearms to pull themselves over into the mother's pouch and to the nipple that is inside that pouch. And if you've ever looked inside a marsupial's pouch, um, it's not what you know you think of as a kid where it's nice and furry and lined and beautiful. Um, it's flesh. It's, it's gross. Um, <laughs> but it's a great, you know, it's, it's kind of like an external womb. It makes it, you know, the, the mother is expending a lot less energy. Um, she doesn't have to get the, the development doesn't happen, have to happen within her. Instead, she just has to make enough energy for that lactation. Um, so they can stay in there for up to a year before they're weaned, and usually after they're weaned, they're off on their own independent immediately. Um, so it's an interesting type of life, or life cycle, right? We have monotremes who are kind of, oh, actually, this is a good uh, example. So we have monotremes who have a semi-long incubation period um, and then a long lactation period and then we have marsupials who have a pretty short gestation period, pretty comparable to the incubation that we see with monotremes, and then pretty much the same lactation period. 
and then we have placental, which is what we are. Um, and that gestation period is longer, but the lactation period is also usually shorter. Um, so in theory, we're, we think that it's a more efficient way. Um, this is kind of down in the, in the development uh, or evolutionary track. So we think of monotremes as the most um, ancient form, and then we evolved into marsupials, and then we evolved into placental. So um, for placentals, they have no epipubic bone, um, which is found in monotremes and marsupials. And that allows, the lack of that allows um, greater expansion of the abdomen for pregnancy. So the epipubic bone would be kind of in the abdominal region, kind of at the pelvic bone. Um, and so when we have that longer pregnancy, we have to have more room for development. Um, they possess a placenta which allows nutrients and oxygen to pass directly from the blood of the mother to the blood of the um, embryo. And the young are born live um, with kind of varying degrees of development. Um, mice, if you've seen newborn mice, they're pretty much hairless and blind and seem pretty underdeveloped. But within a few days, they're um, well on their way to looking like actual baby mice. Um, and then there's ungulates who, you know, within hours, they're up and walking and being actual horses. Um, and then there's us who are somewhere in the middle where, you know, we're born looking vaguely like a human, but we won't be walking for <laughs> quite a few months. And so in placental mammals, as our size decreases, so when we look at tiny little mice, which are placental mammals, um, the metabolic resting rate increases. So a mouse is going to have to eat a lot more relative to its size than an elephant will. An elephant has less of a costly metabolism to maintain than a mouse. This is just kind of the family tree to give you an overview of what we're going to be going into. Um, the monotremes and marsupials, you can see those two right at the top. And everything else is going to be coming after. Um, we're not going into all of these. We're just going into the ones that are relevant to Montana. Um, so we won't be going into primates, thankfully. I'm personally very afraid of chimpanzees, so I have made it a conscious effort to move somewhere that there are no chimpanzees. OK, so we're going to start with even-toed ungulates. So even-toed ungulates, even ungulates, as the name implies, they have an even number of toes. Um, so deer and antelope are going to have the fewest toes. They only have two weight-bearing toes. Um, so when you look at their hoof prints that are, you know, left behind in your front yard in the snow or the dirt, um, take note of that and see if you can compare it when you see other, um, like bovines, like bison, mountain goats, um, see if you can spot the difference there. Um, they're also non-ruminants, so they don't chew cud, um, like cows do. Um, they are, so they're depending, their environment depends on their size with, with even-toed ungulates. So when you have a smaller to medium-sized ungulate, you're going to find them in tall, dense uh, vegetation. Um, so that allows them to hide, right? Because if you're a small ungulate, you're not going to be very, um, you're not going to have a lot of protection. Um, so you're going to have to really rely on the environment to, to hide you from predators. Um, this can kind of be seen with, with baby deer, right? So we have small baby deer. They tend to not be out in the fields with the adults. They tend to be hidden somewhere, theoretically, um, based on what I've seen, the, the quality of hiding places kind of just depends on the mother. Um, but theoretically, they should be aiming for some dense vegetation that the, t that the you know, calf will kind of blend in. Um, but larger... Uh, even toed ungulates like bison, they don't really have a lot to worry about, especially you know because when they're babies, they're protected by the herd. So they're pretty well adapted to a prairie lifestyle. They don't have to rely on thick vegetation. Um, we do have, so let's see, we have almost all of them are obligate herbivores. Um, you will see exceptions to that. Sometimes people will take a picture of like a deer eating uh, like meat. They do that. Deer are weird. Uh, pigs will also do that. Pig, pigiaries will are, are also omnivores. Um, 
notoriously pigs, you know, are used to get rid of bodies sometimes. That's like one of the rumors. I don't know if you guys have heard that too, but <laughs> pigs will eat almost anything. Um, and then they have those laterally positioned eyes. So that's part of when you look at a skull, um, and we'll be doing that today, kind of keep in mind what what the position of those eye sockets tells you about what animal it is. Um, because when you have eye sockets located to the side, it's gonna be better for detecting predators, right? You wanna be on the lookout. Versus if you're a predator, you have your eyes located forward so that you can focus on your prey. And then many have horns, antlers, or tusks. Um, does anybody know the difference between horns and antlers? Uh, one is keratin. One is keratin, yeah. So horns are gonna be keratin, so they consist of bone or have bony core, um, and part of that is keratin, and they are never shed. So when you have rhinoceros horns, which you know are the cause of a lot of poaching for rhinos, those aren't meant to be shed, which is why they're so valuable. Um, on the other hand, we have you know deer shed hunts and all of that where people camp out and wait for the opening season, um, you know, that first opening day, and you can be prosecuted if you don't, you know, pay attention to that opening season. We just got an email about that today of two people who were prosecuted for that, so pay attention to that. Don't get arrested by game wardens. Um, so in Montana, we have three categories of even toed ungulates. We have the bovines, which are going to be bison, mountain goat, bighorn sheep. We have cervidae, which are mule deer, white-tailed deer, moose, elk, and woodland caribou. Um, woodland caribou are, only have a historic range here in Montana. They no longer have a, a current range. Um, but at some point, they were coming in towards Glacier National Park, that area. And then we have pronghorn. That's that historic range. Um, bighorn, or I'm sorry, mountain goats. Um, the reason that you see those two different colors is because in one part they are introduced and non-native, and then another part they are native. So we theoretically do have invasive mountain goats, or at the very least introduced. Um, that's why you might see some shifting of mountain goat populations um, here in Montana and in other parts of this, uh, the country, um, particularly along the Rocky Mountains. Um, moose are the same way. We have a lot of introduced moose in Colorado um, because they are not native to all of the Rocky Mountains. Um, does anybody know why pronghorn horn are so fast? It's not to un outrun humans. It's because we used to have cheetahs here in, in North America. We had the North American cheetah. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about that, I recommend you read um, North American Serengeti, I think it's what it's called. It's by Dan Flores, um, same guy who wrote Coyote America. Um, it's a super cool read just about what animals we historically had and the megafauna that we had here in, in North America. Okay, carnivora, one of our favorite families. Um, so these are going to be animals that have those really enlarged canine teeth, hence the name. Um, they also have enlarged upper premolar, which is going to be that right there. Um, and these canines are going to be large and conical, so it's going to be a cone. Um, and their teeth are going to be maximized towards, you know, shearing and uh, tearing. Um, especially through meat and tendon. And then we have relatively large brains. So these are one of the more intelligent groups. Um, and you kind of have to be when you're a predator because you are trying to outsmart something else. Um, when you are an herbivore, you only have to outsmart the grass, uh, which is theoretically easy. Um, we also have simple stomachs in this group. Um, herbivores can have pretty complex stomachs, especially when it comes to um, having multiple stomachs for processing plant material. Um, this is pretty simple. Usually only one stomach and um, they're just processing meat. However, some animals in this group are omnivor uh, omnivorous. Um, as you, once again, there's, you can't really generalize anything in science. Um, we can call them carnivora, but there's quite a few that aren't strict carnivores. 
Um, and they tend to be relatively long-lived. So we see at least 10 years in this, in this group, um, oftentimes much more. Um, and size ranges wildly. There can be least weasels, which I think are the smallest in carnivora, which are 35 grams, um, and then all the way up to elephant seals, which are 3,600 kilograms. Um, so enormous. Um, and that is larger than polar bears, by the way. That's the largest carnivore is going to be elephant seals. Um, some of them are social. Um, if they are social, they're going to have pretty complex uh, hierarchies of dominance. Um, so within hyenas, those are a really highly social, um, highly complex species um, where the females are going to be the dominant leaders in the groups um, versus lions, which are going to be led by males. Um, again, that darkest mane is generally what indicates dominance, but there's also the lions in Savo who have no manes. So we, again, no generalizations in science. Um, and then they have that top-down control. So we talked you know, before, especially in freshwater ecosystems, we talked about how there can be that bottom-up control of populations uh, within a community. So when all of the phytoplankton is eliminated by invasive zebra mussels, that's going to be a bottom-up control because there's simply not enough phytoplankton for that food web to continue. However, carnivora are often going to be a top-down control. So if there's a large number of lions one year, the gazelles are not going to be doing great that year. Um, and then it'll turn into a bottom-up control because there won't be enough gazelles to feed the lions. So oftentimes it's cyclical. You can see this a lot with the snowshoe hare and lynx populations. Those are, are two that are very closely tied um, just because lynxes are so highly specialized for their prey. Um, usually you can see a direct link um, to the fluctuation of snowshoe hares and lynx. Um, although our lynxes here in Montana don't tend to be as dependent on snowshoe hares just because they have more than one type of hare uh, that they prey upon. Um, another good uh, example is going to be the wolf introduction to Yellowstone. Um, which has caused a lot of woody plants to recover from just having that elk overpopulation. That's all the carnivora members. So it's a huge group. Um, it includes Canidae, which we're going to talk about, um, which are our dogs, our cats, um, our mustelids, which are our weasels, and skunks, which have now gotten their own categorization. They used to be in there with weasels. Now they are not. So, caniformia are going to be dogs and dog relatives, right? We all know these. Um, they tend to be medium-sized. Um, there are some outliers, just like when we talk about um, rarity. There tends to be a lot of the medium. There tends to be a little bit of the small, and then very, very few of the really big. And that's just because there's not enough energy in an ecosystem to keep a ton of really big things alive, and there's probably too much for just to be a ton of really small ones. Um, so they tend to be a lot more omnivorous than anybody else in the group. Um, wolves are pretty well known for eating a ton of berries as well as meat um, and vegetation when they can get it. Um, dogs are the same way, right? What we feed our dog, we don't usually just feed it strict raw meat. We tend to feed it a lot of other things. Um, and with dogs in particular, that becomes, that's because they evolved alongside us. So no longer are they you know, just relying on what they can catch. They're eating our grains that we throw away. They're eating our food waste that we you know, no longer eat. So dogs in particular are going to eat a lot of what we eat. Um, they're adapted for endurance over speed. So you can see that with wolf packs when they're hunting. They don't try to just outrun uh, with a sprint like a cheetah would. Um, they use pack uh, dynamics and then also endurance to kind of run down the weakest of the elk herd or whatever else they're hunting. Um, African painted dogs are actually the most successful hunters on earth. Um, so better than lions, better than anything else that you can think of. Um, they have an 80% 80 uh, success rate um, versus lions are 25%. And then wolves are 14%. So... 
maybe that'll give you a new look at carnivores, because I was certainly surprised when I saw that. I thought success rates were much higher. Uh, polar bears have an abysmal uh, success rate. I think it's something like 99% failure rate, um, which is why they're not doing great now that their habitat is um, degrading, because they already were working with very little success. <laughs> so now it's a lot worse. Um, so we have four species of this group in Montana. We have wolves, coyotes, red foxes, and swift foxes. And swift foxes are a species of concern. Those are swift foxes. I think they look absolutely delightful. Um, this is their current range. Um, in, I think, 1969, they were declared extant, or extinct from Montana. Um, extirpated is what we use from, which is extinct from one location, but not extinct worldwide. Um, so they were extirpated from Montana due to really heavy trapping and poisoning of wolves and coyotes in their early 1900s. Um, swift foxes are really curious, and they're just really vulnerable to being trapped or poisoned. Um, so once we stopped poisoning and trapping wolves and coyotes at the same rate that we did in the 1900s, their population started to recover, um, but really it was the reintroductions onto the reservations that really saved this species in Montana. Um, we have, uh, FWP has reopened trapping uh, for swift foxes. Um, only four were harvested last year with a maximum of 10. I'll let you form your own opinions on whether or not that's a good thing. Um, and then we have a dog footprint, which I thought would be pretty important when you're looking at um, trying to distinguish what you're looking at on, you know, at a nature site. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be somebody's dog, like a, just a domestic dog. But on the off chance that it's not, you can look at some of the, some of the characteristics that make it unique from like a feline. Um, so it's going to have those extended claws because unlike cats, dogs cannot retract their claws. Um, it's going to have, which is, you know, the C and B. Um, B is going to be that lack of a third lobe. So on cats, there would be another uh, lobe right there. And then C is going to be the shape. Um, I'll show you a cat's paw print later, but it's a different shape with C. Um, I wish I had a comparison. That would have been a great idea. Um, so, best way to tell is really I rely on those um, claws, and it's probably a lazy way, but it's a really good way. <laughs> so, Felidae, um, my personal favorite. Um, most of the cats are going to be solitary. They tend to be adept climbers and skilled swimmers. Um, the only ones that aren't good climbers are going to be lions, um, which are notoriously lazy. So, even if they could climb, they probably wouldn't. Um, they're also really highly specialized. Um, so when you look at success rates amongst predators, um, really the only reason African painted dogs are going to be so high is because they work so well as a social pack. Um, otherwise, it's pretty dominated by cats um, just because of how good they are at taking down prey being ambush predators, um, except for cheetahs, for example, which don't tend to be as much on the ambush as they are just out running. Um, they have greater bite force due to the way that their skull is configured, um, although because of their size, that doesn't really end up being the most bite force. You can get a Rottweiler that's bigger than you know a bobcat, and that would have the greater bite force. Um, but for their size, they, are, they have a greater bite force. Um, they have large eyes. They have great vision. Um, that comes into play with them being mostly nocturnal. Um, and they tend to have those really beautiful whiskers um, that helps them with navigation during nocturnal hunting. Um, they are also instinctive hunters, and they will hunt more prey than they can eat, which is problematic when they are invasive, like domestic cats, um, which we will talk about during human-wildlife conflict. And then they can retract their claws, which is super helpful for them. They tend to be kept sharper um, and used as a defense or killing mechanism, um, more so than dogs. 
We have four species in Montana. Those are going to be bobcat, Canada lynxes, feral cats, unfortunately, and then uh, mountain lions. This is the difference between a lynx and a bobcat. Um, pay attention to this because you will need it for our activity. <laughs> um, the big helpful things are going to be lynxes have enormous paws. Um, and why would they have big paws? Snow. Yeah, they're snowshoes. They're built in snowshoes. Um, so it's really cool when we're looking at these animals to see what adaptions they have built into their body. Um, because when we're talking about mammals, we already have that really high metabolism cost, right, by just being endotherms. So look around and see when we're doing that activity what adaptations you, you can see that are saving them energy um, that they would otherwise have to expend. And then they also have longer ear tufts, lynxes do. Um, bobcats have a longer tail, and they tend to be a lot more straight, whereas lynxes tend to have a bigger booty. What do you think that is? Got it. <laughs> OK, then we have the raccoons and relatives. Um, these are a great little group. Um, they also include coatis, which are not found in North America. Uh, actually, they are. Take that back. Arizona has them. Uh, I saw them in Arizona. OK, we don't have them in Montana. <laughs> So characteristics, they have five digits on their forefeet and hind feet. Um, they often walk in that bear-like shuffle. Um, I highly recommend just watching a video of coatis walking because it's very funny. Um, but raccoons also have that characteristic raccoon shuffle that I'm sure you all have seen as they're shuffling off with something of yours or your food. Um, they have claws, but they're pretty short and they're pretty curved and they're non-retractable. Um, and they are omnivorous, and this is what ma makes raccoons so good at adapting. Um, they can eat pretty much anything, and they are determined to eat it. Um, one of my favorite ologies episodes, which is a podcast that is on your little handout, um, is their raccoon podcast episode, um, where they talk to a raccoon researcher. Um, and my favorite thing that they talk about is raccoon intelligence, because we think about raccoons and the way that they can get into anything. Um, how they get into our trash cans and how they get into, I mean, just anything. You leave something out and they'll figure it out. Um, and so, you know, the podcaster asked, you know, were you really excited to work on the intelligence of raccoons? And the researcher said, you know, yeah, I was really excited. And then I realized they're not smart. They're just really stubborn. Um, and they will sit there because they're urban raccoons. They, they know that they will be able to get food somewhere. And so they have the time and energy to invest in just sitting there and playing with something until it breaks. And that's how they get food. <laughs> so it's less smarts and more stubbornness. And it's just nice to see that something uh, can succeed as much as raccoons have with those qualities. Um, it gives us hope for the rest of us. Um, most are going to be nocturnal, and most are going to be to some degree arboreal, um, which is a good way to escape predators. Um, raccoons are a good snack size for a lot of animals, um, especially coyotes. And they're also very good at eating aquatic invasive species. Um, I have suggested multiple times that our team gets raccoons on the payroll. Um, they have eradicated several of our uh, aquatic invasives. Like we, we were, um, the crayfish team was getting rid of a group of invasive crayfish at one of our hatcheries. Um, and they were putting boiling water down the holes of the crayfish holes, the burrows. And um, they came back the next day to go and get in and get, it, get the dead crayfish and make sure everything was gone. And all there was was a bunch of little raccoon paw prints all over and no crayfish left. So that was really cool of them to clean up for us. And we only have one species in this group, and that's the raccoon, that raccoon. Methididae, let's call it that. <laughs> That's going to be the skunk group. Um, and this also includes uh, stink badgers, but we don't have stink badgers here in North America. Um, they have that really conspicuous black and white coloration that warns predators not to mess with them. Uh, they have anal scent glands that can project secretions between one to six meters, um, leaning towards six meters. 
stink badgers are going to be one more towards one meter. Um, but here in Montana, we have skunks that are capable of those six meters distance. So keep that in mind. <laughs> they are omnivorous. They're very good diggers. Um, they have claws and four feet that really allow them to get in and dig for grubs and dig to make little burrows. Um, they are nocturnal. And they have pretty high mortality in the first year, 50 to 70%. So it really hits their adolescence hard. What survivorship curve would that be? One, two, or three? Nailed it, three. Yeah, so three because it has that really steep curve where there's a lot of mortality early on and then it peters out. And it tends to, once you've made it past a certain age and, and gotten to the point where you can defend yourself well, uh, not much is gonna risk getting skunked to eat a skunk. Um, their defensive behaviors are not limited to uh, spraying out their anal gland secretions. They also do handstands, as demonstrated, um, stomping, and they raise their hair. So going back to mammalian fur, it can be used as a defense just by a posture to make themselves look bigger. We have two species, which is going to be the striped skunk and then the western spotted, western spotted skunk. Over there is the western spotted skunk. Um, and unfortunately, skunks are pretty heavily predated by humans, um, intentionally because we don't like skunks, um, either because we don't like our dogs being sprayed or because they are a rabies vector, um, or accidentally. Uh, there's a lot of roadkill skunks. Um, they're not great at avoiding traffic and we're not great at avoiding them. Then we have mustelids. So they are the largest family within carnivora. Um, and they're super cool. These are going to be the weasels and uh, minks and wolverines. Um, they tend to be super smart, um, which can be problems when they're invasive. <laughs> um, mainly carnivorous, really good hunters, um, and they tend to hunt through burrows and crevices. So they have really long, slinky bodies. Well, most of them. Wolverines, not so much. Um, but a lot of them have those long, slinky bodies that al allow them to go in after, you know, rodents and my m rats, rats and mice and whatever little things they can get their teeth on. Um, they tend to have really well-developed anal scent glands, uh, not for spraying as much as it is territorial markings, but it can be used for defense as well. Um, their claws do not retract, but it does make them really good at digging. Um, they have a powerful bite force, and they are mostly quick and agile. Um, they tend to move in those really uh, characteristic bounds and scampers. Um, if you've seen a little weasel during the winter, they tend to make really cute little bounds over the snow. It's really fun to watch. Um, they can be really cool animals to help control rodent populations. Um, so there's been several times where they've been introduced into areas um, that have invasive rodent populations. Um, this is great when they're native. Um, this is very bad if they're not native. Do not introduce mustelids to control rodent populations unless you have something to control the mustelid populations, as many places are discovering. Uh, they have a really good sense of smell and good sense of hearing and vision as well, but their sense of smell is really what tops, tops it out for them. Um, we have 10 species here in Montana. We have the badger, the mink, uh, black-footed ferrets, fishers, least weasels, long-tailed weasel, martens, northern river otters, short-tailed weasels, and wolverines. Um, least weasel is the smallest mustelid, so we do have that. Keep that in mind when you're looking at pelts. That would be the wolverine and that would be the fisher. Both of those are species of concern here in Montana. And wolverines are very hard to find. If you have a spot where you see wolverines, please come up to me after class and tell me. I read an article that they saw one in California for like the first time in 30 years. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's half the places where, you know, they say wolverines are extirpated. It's like, are they actually extirpated or are they just not being seen? Because <laughs> they tend to be really high up in the mountains in really isolated areas. And it you really have to hike in over some rough terrain to go see them. Um, but yeah, they're really cool. Okay, Ursidae. We all know these as Montanans. Um, these are going to be the bears. So 
Most are habitat generalists. And by generalists, this means that they can change their preferred foods, activity patterns, and denning quarters depending on their local conditions. Um, so that makes them really good at surviving most things. Um, oftentimes, not good enough at surviving human things, which we are very good at doing to a lot of really good species. <laughs> Um, they're large and robust, and they have pretty heavy sexual dimorphism, so uh, the males tend to be quite a bit larger than females. Um, they can be double their size, in fact. Um, and this oftentimes, is, so sexual dimorphic traits tend to be uh, things that are based in sexual selection, like mating, um, rather than survival, right? Because if, if a trait was really important to a species' survival, it wouldn't be just in one of the the sexes, it would be in both. Um, so when you see horns in mountain goats that are used for sexual selection, when they bash their heads together and see who's the best at head bashing to win the, win the female, um, those aren't essential to survival. Those are just essential to winning the right to mate. Um, so same with bears, right? You see big male bears are going to fight each other over who can mate that, that year with the female or with the most number of females. Um, they have large, long, non-retractile claws for digging and ripping. Um, who do you think has the larger claws, bear, uh, black bears or grizzlies? Black bears. So it's interesting because you'd think with climbing, right, because black bears climb, whereas grizzlies don't really climb. They can kind of get up there, but not, not well. Um, that black bears would have better claws, but because grizzlies dig so much, they actually have longer claws. Um, they also have those really huge canines. Um, their skulls and their teeth are really well adjusted to what they eat, and what they eat is almost anything. So they're adjusted to taking down you know, an elk to also eating some huckleberries. It's, it's a big range of things. Um, a lot of bears really love moths and moth larvae. That's a huge part of their diet, which might not be an expected part of their diet. Um, so it's not just you know these big takedowns of, of ungulates. It's also a lot of vegetation and berries and fish during migration. Um, does anybody know why grizzlies have that big hump? Just to show the big hump? It is for digging. It's a huge muscle. That's, their, that's all that is, is muscle up there. And it's so that they can dig. And that's because grizzlies are adapted to living on the plains. That's where they evolved, is plains, um, whereas black bears evolved in forests. Um, so that's why one can climb and one cannot. Um, I was reading recently on our, our bear safety um, that you, know, you can climb a tree to escape from a grizzly, but you have to climb high, higher than the grizzly can reach. Um, and also, it's not recommended because, as the National Forest Service says, um, the last time that you probably climbed a tree was when you were 10. Uh, it is a lot harder than you remember. And I did go out and try to climb a tree, um, and it was significantly harder than I remember, and I would have been eaten by a grizzly if it was uh, determined. <laughs> so um, as far as reproduction goes, uh, bears have delayed implantation. So a bear will only have that, um, that uh, fertilized egg implant into the uterus if she's been sufficiently, um, if she's been able to bulk up sufficiently over the fall. So if she goes into winter not having enough food and nourishment to actually get her through the winter with cubs, um, because lactation in itself is a really energetically costly uh, experience, um, then she won't. It just simply won't implant, and she won't have cubs that winter. Um, if she is uh, ready, and she has enough food, and she has enough uh, fat on her, um, then the egg will implant, and she'll give birth during the winter while she's in hibernation. Um, and <laughs> that has to be an experience. You go to sleep, and then you wake up with three kids. Um, <laughs> and those kids will stay with her for up to like three years. Um, so they'll overwinter with her, um, at least for that first year, um, and then they'll come out as sub-adults, um, and they may uh, separate from their mother that second year or in the third year. Uh, it just depends on the mother and the cubs and, and kind of the conditions. 
Um, and then as soon as those cubs are, are off on their own, she'll be ready to be pregnant again as long as, again, as long as she has that fat stores ready and she has enough to get her through. Um, and their vision and hearing is underdeveloped con compared to their sense of smell, which is important to keep in mind for bear safety. Um, they can't always hear or see you coming, so that's why you have to be really loud. Um, and then they are omnivorous and opportunistic, which is, again, things to keep in mind for bear safety. Grizzly bear versus black bear. Biggest things are going to be that shoulder hump. Um, size, do not rely on color. There can be brown black bears, and there can be black grizzly bears, and there can be white grizzly bears. We don't have polar bears in Montana, but it might look like we do if, if an albino grizzly bear comes down. Chiroptera, which is my favorite group. These are the bats. Um, there are over 1,400 species of bats worldwide. Um, it makes up 20% of all extant mammals and is the second largest group um, of mammals. Does anybody know the first largest group? Rodents. <laughs> so the microbat, which is the only type of bat that we have here in Mon Montana, megabats are going to be fruit bats. Um, microbats are going to be uh, capable of true echolocation and that's what they use to find their prey in, at night. Um, and so because of that, they have small eyes and big ears. Um, they are poikilothermic endotherms because they do undergo torpor and hibernation, or at least some of them do. Some of them choose to migrate. Um, and they have pretty long lifespans considering their size. Uh, small mammals are typically pretty short-lived, like mice and rats. Um, but the oldest bat that was captured was 41 years old and could still potentially be living. We just haven't recaptured him. Um, some bats are social. Some bats are solitary. So some bats are going to be crevice roosters um, and roost with a large number of other bats. Um, others are going to be uh, solitary and roost alone. Uh, usually those are going to be tree roosters, um, which are going to be like that hoary bat on the far right, uh, which is my favorite bat, um, the spotted bat, and the pallid bat, I think, are going to be more crevice roosters. Um, pallid bats, which we do have here in Montana, they also eat the most venomous scorpion in North America um, because they are immune to the pain of it, um, which is really cool. Thank you for doing that. And then spotted bats just look really cool, so I thought I'd include their picture. Lagomorpha, so we have the pikas and then the rabbits. Um, Characteristics, they tend to have really rudimentary short tails. Um, they have fold of, folds of skin on their lips that can meet behind their incisors. So if you've ever seen a rabbit chew, um, you can kind of see their, their lips going behind their front teeth. Um, and that lets them chew without opening their mouth, um, which can be really helpful when they're gnawing on something and they don't want to get stuff in their mouth. Um, they can also close their... Um, I think their nostrils with the, that same flap, so it kind of protects them from getting stuff, uh, especially if you're chewing on something like wood and you don't want to get slivers in your mouth and your nose. Um, they are rodent-like in that they have those really long incisors, um, similar to these, not these exactly, but similar to these, um, and they are ever-growing, so they just continue to grow, and that's why they have to gnaw on things or... It's actually why they're so good at gnawing on things is because those teeth are built to never wear down. Um, because as you can imagine, if you chewed on trees for all your life, your teeth would get worn down pretty quickly. Um, so it's a very good thing that they have those incisors that keep growing. And then they're all terrestrial herbivores. Um, this is a pica. It lacks a visible tail, and it has really short ears. Um, it's also adorable. Um, they have a cloaca. Um, which is kind of unusual for mammals in this group. Um, and they have a really high metabolic rate, which is, comes back to what we talked about, where that small mouse needs more food and more energy to maintain its metabolic rate than the elephant. We have seven species here in Montana. Uh, the two of concern are going to be the pygmy rabbit and then, or I'm sorry, just the one of concern is the pygmy rabbit. I always think the pika is a species of concern because I'm from Colorado where they are a species of concern. And then we have Rodentia. This is the last group that we're going to talk about. Um, there are 2,000 extant species. They make up 40% of all mammalian species. Um, they also have that ever-growing incisor, 
um, or upper and lower incisors, um, which is really good because, again, they are another one that likes to gnaw on things. Um, they also, so if we're talking about beavers, um, which is Castoridae, um, they are going to be ecosystem engineers, which does anybody know what that means? Yeah, so they are capable of building a whole little new ecosystem or microclimate um, just by their normal behavior. So in the case of um, beavers, they do this in two ways. The first is that they feed on bark and leaves, and they often, in doing so, they fell those really large trees. Um, and they have a preference for which types of trees they eat. And so that preferentially selects certain trees for an ecosystem to continue growing. Um, and then the second way is that they modify streams and lakes by building their dams, which is probably what most people know about them. Um, by damming up streams and rivers, they create these really big um, uh, flood floodplains, um, which creates a whole new microclimate for a lot of different animals um, that may not otherwise be able to live there. Um, it also makes really good area for nesting and nurturing animal or young animal because nurturing young animals because it's not high, you know, that high flowing stream. You can't really do a lot with that um, when it comes to young. So it's a lot more protected to, to have young develop in beaver habitat. Um, it's also a really important refuge for forest fires. So um, a recent study, and I can't remember what I was listening to, it was some sort of podcast. Chances are it's one of the podcasts I listed for you. Um, they were talking about how beaver habitats have been really critical for reducing the um, intensity of forest fire heats or forest fire heat, and then um, helping survivor survivorship of uh, native species that are able to retreat to those refuges. And that's especially important when we have forest fires that tend to burn so hot, um, unlike what forest fires usually should be, which is kind of low intensity, high frequency. And then we have 46 species in Montana. I'm not listing all of them. We have the beaver, the North American porcupine, uh, and then the northern grasshopper mouse, which is really cool. Look that up on YouTube. They do like this howling scream thing, and they are predators. So I think that those are really cool. Activity time. OK, so everybody has at their table some pelts. Um, please, for this activity, go and collaborate. Um, over here, I have a list, theoretically, if everybody at my office put everything back, which maybe, um, this should list all of the animals that we have out. Um, on the back, there's a little info sheet to learn more about them. It is oriented more towards children, but information is still good information. Um, see if you can match each slide with the pelt. And we also have skulls up here that once you're through with this, um, and matching this, we can go and match some skulls with a guidebook that I have up there. So collaborate. Go and look at all the pelts. Please touch them and look at all the adaptations. And I'll go around with you guys and kind of talk about them as we go. So OK, up we go. <laughs>